Hey yo, what's up everybody? What's going on folks? Welcome to the True Training Group live stream. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Michael Edward Paranati. I go by Michael Edward and I'm the co-founder and head trader of True Training Group. In case you guys did not know, we are a Benzinga FinTech Awards finalist for the best data analysis tool in 2023. We are also currently the fastest growing and highest rated premium online educational platform that combines university level professional trading and investing courses with premium stock market tools live workshops, and individual mentorship and coaching on stocks, options, crypto, and futures. We day trade, we swing trade. We also cover long-term investing. There's literally something for everybody in your trading group. But you see, we take that curriculum and we pair it up with eight professional full-time trading moderators at True Trading Group that are with you each and every single day from pre-market all the way through, to, through into the close, sharing their screens, providing their commentary, their analysis, answering questions, letting you know what positions they're getting in, they're getting out in real time. You guys are going to get access to our members of True Trading Group, the most educated, helpful, supportive, and successful community of traders that you're ever going to find. We have 10,000 members in 115 different countries, truly a global community here at True Trading Group. And why should you listen to any of the stuff that we discuss on this channel? Guys, I did not figure this stuff out on my own. I began my career working at T3 Alpha Fund in New York City. It was my first job right out of college. And then they had me go through an educational training program before the fund let me touch even $1 of their money. And then 2008 happened. And that was the Great Recession. It was a huge stock market crash, but it also was the same year I received one of the firm's Trader of the Year awards. Now you fast forward and I'm the co-founder and head trader of True Trading Group. And along with my team of those eight professional trading mods and an over 30 person staff, like I said, we've helped thousands of members from 115 different countries to reach their goals. Okay. We also did not start with an intro, guys. I know I usually start with an intro on this live stream, but we did not start with the intro. I see some couple of people that are commenting about, hey, with the intro, the intro, the intro. We did not go with the intro um, here today because we have a very important live stream that I didn't want to waste another moment getting into. We have a very special guest that's going to be joining us here today. If you guys have not yet done so, make sure you subscribe to this channel, smash that like button, Turn on your notifications. Make sure you guys never miss out on any of these streams because we're dropping golden nuggets on a regular basis. And my goodness, do we have an amazing stream in store for you guys all here today. Another strong day in the markets. Markets ripping to, to new highs. We are a stone throw away off those all-time highs that were put in following the Fed meeting. And everybody wants to know, how much higher can this market rally really go? Some people don't think this market rally makes a whole lot of sense. Other people think it makes total sense. There's been this big debate going on about when and if there is a when and if there is a pullback that is going to be coming. That's what everybody really wants to know. And I have the absolute perfect guest to have that discussion with me here today. Guys, I want to introduce you to and I want to welcome you to someone that I listen to every single time. This man comes on CNBC. Whenever I hear his voice, I poke up like this. Says, All right, what is what is what is he going to say? What do you have to say? An amazing, um, just economic mind, senior economics reporter at CNBC. Everybody, give a big TTG warm welcome to none other than Mr. Steve Leisman. Hey there. Hey. Oh, Steve, you got to mute the other. Oh. Hey there, does that work? Yep, that works perfectly fine. Steve, how are you, man? Can can you hear me okay? Yep, now, now we can. Yes, yes, Steve hears me all right? Yep. Ah, perfect, ah, perfect. I can I can hear you when you you got to talk, then I got to talk. We're having this terrible technical difficulty. So I'm going to uh, give me a thumbs up when you're done talking, Mike. I got to mute you so I can talk, okay? Gotcha. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'll, we'll, we'll go through. We'll do one. Then we'll just we'll get right into it, Steve, since, since we have, you know, we are having a couple of little technical difficulties, everybody. So we do apologize about that. But nonetheless, we're going we're gonna to push through this. We're going to make this happen. What we're going to do here is – I am going to just get right into it. I've got a bunch of questions that I want to go over and I want to ask Steve. Steve, just so you are aware, we actually had some of our members that actually submitted some questions to us um, on some things that they wanted to ask you. And, you know, it's it's just the perfect time for us to kind of have this discussion because we just got done with the Fed meeting. Um, we got a short week this week and it's kind of strange because we've got a really important piece of data coming out on Friday. 
and the market's closed. <laughs> so a lot of people kind of want to know how we're going to handle this. So I'm going to get right into it, Steve, if you don't mind. I'll start with the first question. Once I'm done, I'll give a thumbs up and then we can unmute, unmute and then we can uh, we can go through from there. So here's, here's my first kind of question for you, Steve, because going into the Fed meeting, right? Everybody knew there was not going to be a rate cut, right? There was no real debate about that. But what I was, what I personally was listening for from Jerome Powell was whether or not he felt that the Fed was going to be caught between a rock and a hard place because you got those hotter than expected inflation reads in January and February. And you had this other, there's some other economic indicators that were showing that, oh, maybe the consumer is slowing down or the economy is slowing down. And the one thing that I wanted right. to listen for was, does Jerome Powell feel that the Fed stuck? Because as we know, the Fed's got two mandates, maximum employment, price stability. If the labor market cracks at the same time inflation accelerates, they can't do both. So I wanted to hear, was he worried about that? And there was one thing that really stood out to me during his speech. And I'm sure, I mean, he added a new statement and he repeated it twice. Right. And that statement was, as the labor market tightens, tightness has eased and progress on inflation has continued, the risks to achieving our employment and inflation goals are moving into better balance. He repeated that sentence about moving into better balance twice. And as soon as he right. said that, that moment and Steve, you know, in true trading, we're active traders. So like that moment, we said, guys, that's it. This is a dovish drone, pal. We're clear to make new all-time highs. And I was surprised at his dovishness. So my question to you was, were you surprised at how dovish he was? Like, I thought he was going to be mildly hawkish. But like, what were your thoughts on how dovish he was? Was it a surprise to you? So a lot of times... I hear things differently from how the market does. And I'm not always right, but sometimes the market proves me right the next day or later. And sometimes other officials prove me right later. I didn't hear Powell being all that dovish. I think he signaled the cut out there. And in any event, I'm not that sure that I care how dovish Powell sounds because I think you got to watch the data. Mm -hmm. And the data was kind of squirrely, I guess is a good way to put it, for January and February. Um, and the Fed reacted to that. And then I looked at what's called the dot plot. And I'm assuming everybody here knows what the dot plot is. But the dot plot is the forecast by each Fed official for where they think the Fed forecast is going to be. And it kind of shifted a little bit to the right, which actually meant the Fed committee as a whole, the 19 members, were more... Um, were more hawkish and 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 so they were more hawkish in fact than the fed suggested so what does this all mean i i don't think i want to bore you folks with is it going to be three cuts two cuts or one cut or, or how much i think you have to watch the data my concern right now is i you have some an increase in some commodity prices that have been going up you've got this problem at the port in baltimore that could have an effect you have this problem in the red sea at the straits of Cruz that could have an effect um I'm not sure that the March inflation data, which comes out in April, is going to be helpful to the cause for cuts. I still think that you're going to have a gradual decline in inflation in which the Fed will be able to cut. But I'm not sure June is a lock, um, and I don't think three cuts are a lock right now. So I would say I'm a little bit suspect, but you could say Powell was dovish in the future, if the inflation numbers begin to come down, the Fed is just not going to be satisfied with um, 3% inflation rate. That's not going to be on. You also have this issue, which is the economy is doing fairly well. You had strong numbers in the third quarter, surprisingly strong numbers in the fourth, not as much of a come down as we expected. And the first quarter looks right now to be running I'm going to give it a 2% number. It's early days yet for the data that we have. But 2% is an important number because it's just ever so slightly above potential, which means it's not creating slack in the economy, which means it's not really helping out. It's not hurting inflation, but it's not going to help inflation. You're not going to run below potential. So um, with the economy being relatively strong, unemployment still below 4% or 3.9%. There's a, there's a thing that I've been saying, which is, 
if it ain't broke, how much fixing does the Fed really have to do? And I'm not sure they have to do a whole lot of fixing. You note that there's a lot of fiction built into the market. Those three cuts are built into the futures market, and a whole boatload of cuts are built into next year. I think if I were an investor right now, I would trade with the possibility, the probability, that there'll be one or two cuts this year. But assuming this is something like a poker game, and I know you guys work hard to make it so it's not a poker game, I wouldn't be all in with all my chips on three cuts this year. Yeah, I, I, I'm... Steve, I'm dead right there with you on that. I actually, the last like two weeks or really not last two weeks, ever since the Fed meeting, I've kind of been talking to our our, our members about, you know, the possibility of seeing some of that, inc some increased volatility as the year goes on. And, you know, one of the questions that I actually had for you is it's funny because when we started this year, the markets were pricing in like six rate cuts. And if, if you asked me months ago, Right. If we thought if we said months ago, the market's going to go from six cuts to three and you're going to get two consecutive, you know, higher than expected or sticky or annoying, whatever you want to call it, inflation numbers, that the S&P would be above fifty two hundred. <laughs> if you said that to me months ago, I would have said probably not. But what is it that you, what is it that you, but, but nonetheless, here we are and the market's been extremely resilient. And like you said, the economy has been, been extremely resilient. And is that really what we, what you would attest the, the overall market strength and this, this continued move in, in Q1? Is it really just that, Hey, the economy's holding up and inflation is coming down. Is it, is it just that, that simple? Is that where, is that really where, this rally kind of comes from because I would have never thought hotter than expected inflation and three cuts instead of six. And now we're talking about the possibility of even two cuts that the market would still be where it is today. Is it just really the economy? The numbers have just been better than everybody thought. You know, I think you make a really good point. And I'd like to just go back and tell everybody that when the market started pricing in six cuts, I told the market they were crazy. Not everybody. Yeah, was I, yep. Um, you did. I remember. <laughs> But it's important to point out that even if you thought that was going to happen, it was not a bad trade. I completely agree with you at being astonished at how well the market has held up with what amounts to a really massive and significant adjustment in the outlook for rates. Yeah. Um, and I have a theory on this, by the way, which is that we know one thing. We're pretty sure the Fed is not going to go higher or much higher. One of the things that happened when the Fed made what was a tentative pivot away from hiking, you know, was that all of a sudden a certain stability got on the horizon there. Um, you know, we kind of felt like we didn't know if ahead of us was a cliff or a steep hill or, or who knew what, or maybe, maybe the road went straight. But now we can be pretty sure we're somewhere in the range of what the 10 year is going to be. Hmm. You know, what is it, 430 right now? Hang on, I didn't get a quick look before I before how it closed here. Um, so the 10-year closed at four, sorry, 418. Um, the, uh, the, the, the two years at 456. All right, so look, four and a half looks to be a good top to the 10-year. It would be wonderful if it fell to three and a half. I kind of had some optimism that over the course of this year, it could fall further but not without a decline in inflation and a move by the Fed. So I think you're looking at a four to four and a half, 10 year. And I think that's something you can, what's the way to say it? You can shoot a dart at that, so to speak, or you can have your legs underneath you with which to make some decisions about investing. Remember, there were concerns it was up at five, um, yeah. thinking it was going to go higher. So I feel like that's a pretty good basis for which to just make some decisions. And then the earnings started coming in. And I mean, I'll take your take on this, Mike, better than mine, but they haven't been too bad. And it yeah. feels like the consumer's holding up. So what do you get? You give up a couple quarter point cuts, but you get an economy that's not slowing down. You get low unemployment. You get people good wage gains that they've had so far. Um, I think I'll take that trade all the time. And I've, you know, I've argued against my own best interests a lot to say the market gets too hung up on the Fed. When, and it ignores sometimes the economics that are out there and the data that's out there. If you tell me I can, I can have 2% growth, 2.5% growth, decent earnings reports, good unemployment, 
uh, low unemployment rates, and I give up a quarter point or a half a point of rate cuts every day, gentlemen. Yeah, and, and I'm and, I, and I'm pretty sure Jerome Powell would take that every day too. <laughs> you know, it's 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 been the everything that the Bulls have wanted to get, they've got right, and it's like all of the as you go through the the, the bearish arguments that have been really kind of falling by the wayside almost like as time goes on, it seems like some of the bearish arguments start to, you know, become less and less, but it really does seem like it's fine that they're going to hold rates higher for that, you know, the higher for longer, which is a term that has been used a lot. And was, it was used to be something that everybody was worried about. Oh, higher for longer, higher for longer used to be something of, of concern. But higher for longer because the economy is actually doing much better and the Fed could keep things higher for longer is actually not a negative. It's turned out to be a net positive because with the economy doing what it's been doing and inflation still going on that downward path, it's exactly the recipe for the soft landing that the Fed thinks that they're going to be able to pull off. And as time goes on, it seems like that becomes more and more likely. And that brings me to um, my next question, actually, coming up to on this Friday with, okay, inflation still on that downward path. One of the things that Jerome Powell said when he was specifically talking about, I, I forgot who it was. I think one of the one of the reporters in the room with you on that day had asked the question about those, those January and February prints. And Jerome Powell's feeling that although it's not really what they would have wanted to see, it's not enough to make them feel that the overall trajectory has changed. They still feel like inflation is moving to the down. Is, is moving downward. And I'm wondering, what do you think would have to happen for that stance to change? Because I know you have the PCE, on, PCE number on Friday, which I'm expecting to come in a little bit hot like the CPI and PPI did. But what do you think would change Jerome Powell and the Fed's stance on, okay, maybe that downward trend is in jeopardy? Is it is it a March CPI print also higher than expected? Like what would have to happen for them to really change, you think, after after having those conversations with them? So here's the thing. I think of it like a like a wrestler, okay? And you pin him to the ground and you start counting one, two, and then he gets up. And you pin him down again, you start to start counting one, two, he gets up. So it literally is sort of one, two, three. If you can give me three months in a row of good inflation, look, the Fed believes it's restrained, it's restricted right now, believes it's at a restrictive level, a fairly restrictive level. I think they want to come down. I think they do want to reduce rates. I think that's what you heard when you were talking about the top and Powell sounded dovish. He wants mm -hmm. to do it. I think there was a good quote from one of the economists I follow who said they want to do it, but they want to do it in a responsible way. Um, and so that means they have to be, what in their own words, confident that inflation is heading back towards the two percent level what do i do for a living i parse those words all the time and what does that mean it means that um they don't have to be at two percent to cut they've got to be confident they're coming down so what you need to have is a couple months in a row that resumes the very nice progress we had in the inflation rate last year it was a pretty look look the decline in inflation um, really outstripped most projections. It came down further. The Fed had to bring down their inflation forecast because of where, where the year started in 2024. So get a couple months in a row under your belt. I, I think they wouldn't mind. They're not they're not rooting for this, but they wouldn't mind some easing in the uh, employment market. You talked about that. Um, they, they'd like to see that. They'd still like to see growth going. What I don't want to see, what no one wants to see, what is the worst outcome for everybody on this channel would be for the economy to start to, 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 to stall, and then the Fed would have to enact a lot of rate cuts to respond to it. Um, I don't see that on the horizon. And if anybody wants to point out for me what I'm missing, because I look at this every day, what are the risks that I'm missing? What's going to hit me on the back of the head that I didn't see? Uh, and I don't even mean a black swan of that. I just mean, is there something in the data right now that is something that's deteriorating in a really in, in a really concerning way that the Fed should be watching and should force their hand? And the trouble is, Mike, I can't find that thing right now. I don't know what that is. Um, and so um, if, 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 if that is out there on the horizon, then I'll hammer Powell at the press conference and say, hey, Mr. Chair, 
how are you ignoring this incredibly terrible statistic in the economy that really is a matter of concern? And I don't know what that question is to ask him right now. And I don't think anybody, any single reporter at the press conference had that question or had that statistic to, to lay over his head and say, you're being foolish here. It doesn't appear that way. The only case you could make is by remaining a, at the restrictive level or far above the neutral level for so long, they're perhaps planting the seeds of much slower growth down the road. But I don't see that. The housing market, of course, is difficult. You have a lot of concern, I think, with the amount of debt that's out there. But I'll just leave it there. If you have something, Mike, you want to hammer me with that I'm missing, I'm always all ears. Yeah, I, I, I don't have anything. It's, you know, I would have, you know, I'm surprised at the labor market. I keep looking for, you know, those jobless claims numbers and the continuous claims numbers. And especially the last couple of weeks, they've been good. You know, they've been good. And you do see the easing in like the job openings data. That's kind of starting to cool itself off and come back into a little bit more of a balance. I mean, we were almost at a two to one. Um, you know, last year when you were talking about job openings versus people looking for a job and that's coming more into balance, you know, yeah, sure. You know, unemployment went from three, seven to three, nine, but three, nine is still historically very low. And, you know, even if it ticks up to four, oh, four, one, that's still that, like you said, is maybe the, that little easing that the fed would not necessarily hope for, but they would welcome it. I don't see any of the data that is really alarming. Yeah. You have the credit card debt that people, you know, always refer to, but as long as people are employed, you know, it, it's kind of, it goes right back to the government, the government's debt. It's like, well, as long as you're, as long as you can pay your bills, debt isn't necessarily the bad thing that, that people. Get yeah, let, me, let me interrupt you for a second, Mike, because I think you, you, you're on to something. I, I don't necessarily see the leverage in the private sector that worries me. That's the kind of stuff that really can cause a shock to the mm -hmm. system. Um, there is the CRE thing. Somebody mentioned that in the feed. I appreciate that. The thing about that is at least the feds and regulators know about this. Banks know about this. If they're not reserving against losses in commercial real estate, um, at least the office part of it, they should have their license to be bankers uh, taken away right away. So um, leverage is the thing and debt is the thing that kills you. Um, look, we watch very carefully on CNBC every single auction that's out there. The government is selling a lot of debt. But you know what? The world is taking down the debt. They're yeah. buying it. And, um, you know, Rick and I have a bit of a running argument. He gives them C's and D's because of some very technical factors. He's really smart about that. I give them A's because I breathe a sigh of relief. They sold all that debt. <laughs> I love I love watching you and Rick on CNBC kind of go back and forth. It's, 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 it's very entertaining, but also very informative. Um, you, you know, switching right on to, since we're on the, the banking industry and that kind of topic, I actually have a question there that I wanted to ask you about the, the bank term funding program coming to an end. And for, for viewers that are on here, if you guys don't know about the, the BTFP, it was actually a facility that was put into action by the Fed to provide liquidity. This was right around last year during the Silicon Valley crisis to avoid a possible run on the banks and give the banks the liquidity that they needed. Um, the program was a huge success, by the way. You, you know, I mean, the Fed was actually able to provide the necessary liquidity and still sneak in another rate hike just like a week and a half later after launching the program. Because a lot of critics said, oh, this is this is inflationary, you know, the, them coming to the rescue again, and it's going to cause inflation. Right. The, Fed even, the Fed even snuck in another rate hike after they launched that program, which was impressive. But my question to you is, Steve, now, after with this coming to an end and you still have QT going on, right, are there any concerns or uh, amongst, like, is there anything that you're watching to make sure that none of those smaller regional or community banks run into any liquidity problems with, like, Everyone's talking about commercial real estate and the losses that you have there. Like you just kind of mentioned, if you're not preparing for that, you should lose your banking license. But is there anything that could possibly be problematic now with that program coming to an end that you're paying attention to? Mike, let me give you a theory I've been working on for a little while here. And tell me if this works for you. And, and, and hopefully folks will understand this. The systemic risk is equal to the amount of money that you're worried about times the opacity of the problem, okay? 
<laughs> so I'm going to say that in a little bit more English. If you don't know where the bodies are buried, it's a fucking calamity. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but if you know where the bodies are buried, even if it's a lot of money, then the opacity multiplier is very low. What happened in the great financial crisis? Nobody knew where the bodies were buried. Yeah. You could possibly walk any place and pick up the plague because you were walking around and you're going to hit a dead body. So here's the thing. We know where the debt, we know where the, where the, where the uh, debt is. We know where the potential losses are. They could be at the bank. But if you tell me tomorrow that Bank X, I don't know, call it a $10 billion bank or call it a $100 billion bank, has a big commercial real estate problem and they're going to close down. I think that would be a hiccup in the market. I don't think it's a calamity. There aren't going to be bank failures. You know what? One of the things we screwed up this system a little bit is there should be bank failures. We should Too many be in a world where there are no bank failures. Um, banks should have the freedom to fail just as surely as every other business out there. But the key thing is to avoid the systemic risk. You avoid the systemic risk by keeping the opacity multiplier low, which is to say, I don't know that regional banks are the best place to be in right now, but you hope that there's a trade there because they recognize their losses and the market has recognized those losses. Yeah, no, you're right. Really good point. It's um, back uh, last year, we were. Uh, and if you remember, Steve, we actually you actually spent some time with us last year, right around it was in March. Actually, it was right around the banking crisis, and I was trying right. so I was trying so hard to um, explain to people why that Silicon Valley situation was not 2008, and it was it was it, it the, the two things are really aren't were not even really comparable. And, and honestly, even if you look at now, it's it's really a situation where what we've even seen is the regional banks have had their issues, but to the benefit of a lot of your bigger banks, like you take a look at JP Morgan and what, I mean, just take a look at what JP Morgan stock has done. A lot of your bigger banks have actually benefited from some of the things that have happened. But to your point about not knowing what the issues were in 2008, I think is a really, really, really good point that a lot of people on the, on this, on this stream right now can really kind of let that sink in because when everybody's talking about what the problem is going to be, it's not a surprise. It's not a shock to the system. It's when you're, it's the thing. That's, things why, you're that's not why I asked you, Mike. That's why I asked you, tell me the stuff I don't, I can't see. You know, um, I, I want to point out here, Brendan Fraser says, I don't trust any authority or institution with transparency. I, I, I think he's right to be skeptical. I, I, I also think the Fed is probably on top of this one. Haven't gotten bit in the ass on the last one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then I uh, so I see I know I know you you gotta you gotta run in a couple minutes. I'll just um, one last question that I got then for you, Steve, because I asked you back in 2023, right? I was you know with everything that was going on, I asked you if you were still in, if you were still investing because we were still investing that down at that time, and you said yes. And now you fast forward to today, the market's at all time highs, and everybody's so worried about oh I don't believe it, I don't trust it, I'm worried about a rug pull. Are you still investing? Yeah, I am. I mean, I got to be I got to be sixty since we last spoke, so I'm thinking a little bit oh, more happy about birthday. what my stock exposure is, and I'm thinking a little bit more about uh, you know maybe there's a retirement uh, in some number of years that I can count on both hands. So I'm thinking a little bit more about my um, my portfolio relative to my age. My dad, who yeah. passed away unfortunately a couple years ago, at ninety two. For the entire time, he had the portfolio of a 30-year-old. Um, so um, I, I'm a little bit, uh, <laughs> I kept telling him, Dad, get rid of the margin account. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You know, he was 92 yeah. and had a margin account. Um, and he, he always said, just buy good stocks and hold on to them. I and he wasn't too wrong about that either. Yeah. Um, but, but still, you know, I could have inherited a few more bucks. But, you know, God bless him, he left me some at all. That was all good. <laughs> In, awesome. any, in any event, um, yeah, I'm, I'm invested. I'm just thinking about it. Look, there is an interesting question that you should ask yourself, okay? So what did I say the 10-year was? 418. Yeah. The two-year is, um, uh, is 450. You know, 
two things I want to say about that. The first thing is when we talk about hire for longer, it does mean that the competition from the, um, the bond market or from fixed income is going to remain there for the stock market, okay? So that benchmark, that hurdle you got to get over to say, you know what, it's worth it to take the risk in stocks. That's going to be something that will continue to pressure stocks over time. Uh, we do have an aging population, and they're going to be thinking, you know what, I don't necessarily want to be in all stocks forever. Um, so there'll be that as well. But the other thing is you have to ask yourself a question. Right now, you can put your money in a money market and get that four and a half, okay, or even get five. I don't know what, what, what exactly the, the rates are right now. If the Fed does cut, that goes away. So is there a point you want to think about for a portion of your portfolio locking in some duration on in, in the fixed income world. There are a variety of things out there. There are corporate bonds. They're very tight to treasuries right now. So they're, they're a little bit on the expensive side. Um, there's other ways to do that, to think about locking in some of these rates. I do think the direction of rates is down. I don't think it's as down as I thought it was three or four months ago, but it is down. So there's a point where you're going to want to think, you know what? Four and a half forever or for 10 years or 430, 420 forever, I could sleep maybe a little better night with some of my portfolio. So I think that's some thinking people have to do. On the other hand, on the other side of that, there are very exciting things going on in the economy. There's AI out there. Um, and I think that is the big game changer. Um, and, and the U.S. economy is very dynamic. Um, and there's a lot of tech progress and a lot of companies out there that are innovating. So while you do that, risk-free stuff keep your eye open on the other stuff going on out there yeah definitely yeah i'm with you on the ai stuff I mean, we're, we're actually doing a lot of work within your trading group building out our own ai tools and everything we have a an ai assistant called we call it mari that adam and the development team have been working on so we're with you on that and, and speaking to the fixed income stuff i actually had my father recently you know my father's 67 and he recently also you know taken advantage of some of those longer term um, as some of, you know, the, the, the longer term durations to, to lock in some of that money. But, uh, Steve, I want to thank you so much for spending time with us here today. And listen, guys, all of our viewers, okay. If you guys are in the New York area, okay. If you are in the New York area and you are fans, okay. Of the Grateful Dead, there is a amazing concert going on in Central Park. On May 14th, the show is actually in honor of the famous Grateful Dead concert that happened in that historic band shell in 1967. And yours, yours truly, Mr. Steve Leesman, is going to be there. Steve, you want to tell people about, about the concert? I know it's for a really great cause. Guys, we're going to post a link also if you guys want to, want to donate to the cause. Riverkeeper, it's an excellent cause. Steve, you want to say something about that? Go right ahead. Yeah, Mike, thank, thanks for that. Um, I mean, it's so cool you can put the graphics up. I, I really appreciate that. So um, my mental health program is being a, uh, the rhythm guitar player in a uh, fairly popular Grateful Dead band called the Stella Blues Band. And every year we get a permit from New York City to, um, uh, to do a permit in the, to do a, a concert in the park um, to commemorate the Grateful Dead playing in that very same band shell there. And we do it to the benefit for Riverkeeper. And uh uh, we have a bunch of folks, the Friends of Free Dead in the Park, that come out and they give us money to put on this show. And whatever is left over, we give to Riverkeeper to help clean up the Hudson. I'm a member of the board of directors of Riverkeeper. And we, um, uh, we've cleaned up the river to the point where nine communities now get their drinking water out of it. But we're expanding our mission to try to get more uh, uh, communities able to use the water, swim in the water. Um, it used to be years ago, you could tell what color they were painting the Hudson River um, by the by uh, what color um, they're, they're painting the, the, the uh, cars at the GM factory in Tarrytown on the Hudson. The river would turn that color. That doesn't happen anymore. But we still have PCBs in the river. We still have bacteria. We still have sewage going into the river. We have to fight all this all the time. And we're trying to clean the river up. And we have a new Bring Back the Fish campaign because I'm also a desperate and somewhat obsessed fly fish. So nice. if you want to help out the river, um, come to the show or go to the link and give a donation. I appreciate, Mike, the ability uh, to make this pitch for folks. It's a really good cause, and we're doing really good and important work. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, guys, definitely, if you're in the New York City area, 
May 14th. Go check it out. It's an awesome time. We were posting up some pictures. I'm also told, I understand that some other CNBC anchors and reporters, analysts, contributors, they also attend. I know it's been a really great, really, really, really great time. And, and guys, make sure you click on the link, Riverkeeper. It's an amazing cause. Donate, show some love, and show Steve how much we appreciate him coming on here. There's one more thing. We're actually going to be um, we're going to be on air on CNBC.com on Good Friday morning. Hope it doesn't offend anybody's religious sensibilities, but we're also very uh, religious uh, about the economic data. So I think it from 8:15 to 8:45 we'll be on air on CNBC.com um, uh, awesome. reporting on the PCE numbers and the uh, income and spending numbers when they come out. Um, And just a word, Mike, I really appreciate this opportunity to join. You guys ask great questions. And I love the commentary over here. You guys are really uh, up on the issues here. uh, And it's a really educated crowd that I'm I'm humbled to be able to address it. No, no, thank you very much, Steve. I really appreciate that. I mean, coming from you, someone that asks the best questions (laughs) whenever there's Whenever there's a, a Fed meeting or an interview, you've done such amazing work. I, I truly, I, I really mean it. Whenever I hear your voice on CNBC, the volume gets turned up. I need to listen to what's going on, to what you're saying. And trust me, I'll be I'll be paying attention Friday morning for the analysis when that data does come out. So, Steve, thank you so much for for spending I'll time with us. Again, Mike. This won't be the yeah. last time. We'll do this again for sure. Oh, awesome. I really appreciate it, Steve. Have a great night. Thank you. So everyone, give Steve a big, huge thank you for spending time with us. And go click on that link and support Riverkeeper. Steve, it was, was a pleasure, man. I look forward to talking to you again soon. We need at 7 o'clock tonight for Fed Governor Waller's comments. Nice. Perfect. We're, we're watching. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Steve. Bye. Take care. All right, folks. Well, you there you have anybody it. Anybody knew that I was on there, where he was on nah, the. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't really. I don't necessarily think anybody really knew. What a great. He's such a great guy, man. He's just a Dude. wealth of knowledge. It's just unbelievable. I, I, I gotta tell you, huge shout out to Glenny, one of our pro trading mods, for for, you know, for, for putting this together and and um, you know, super super grateful. And and guys, if you could click that link, visit Riverkeeper. It would really really. Uh, mean a lot to us and to Steve and the guy gives so you know has given a lot of his time to us. Uh, he doesn't have to. He's not paid for it. So um, you know, be really great. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. And yeah. also for members, for members, we are going to um, we are going to do the AI boot camp or AI accelerator. Uh, we are going to do it inside of the main chat room tonight um so yeah we will meet there okay that's going to be in about 30 minutes oh it's coming back in hang on no he's gone (laughs) there you go yeah man so Listen, guys. I, I hope you guys really enjoyed, uh, really enjoyed that. I mean, Steve's a very busy guy. He's got to he's got to go, and you got a, another Fed members going to be speaking, so he's got to go and he's got to cover those comments. So make sure you guys tune in. I think he said seven o'clock. Um, he'll be um, going over, covering and analyzing Fed member Waller's comments. Um, so that's something that you guys want to tune in and definitely listen to. And like I said, click on that link, guys. Show Steve how much we appreciate him coming on this stream and, and spending time with us and, and educating the entire TTG family and the entire TTG community. So make sure you guys click on the link that we're sharing, you know, donate to an amazing cause. And if you guys are in the area, May 14th, Central Park, beautiful summer day, go ahead right there. Or well, actually a spring day. It wouldn't be summer yet, but you guys can go ahead and enjoy the Stella Blues Band for a beautiful day in Central Park. All right. So... And then you guys guys have the AI, uh, the AI accelerator with Adam is taking place um, inside of the main chat room in just about 30 minutes. I'm curious to see on the, the live stream right now, I'm curious to see how many people are on here that are not members of True Trading Group. Can you guys do me a favor and just type the letters TTG if you're not a member of True Trading Group, you guys were just here and just kind of um we're, we're here for steve and for the interview if you're not part of the community can you guys do me a favor real quick and just type ttg inside of chat 
Just type TTG for those of you that are not members of True Trading Group. Just want to see who we have here that's not part of the that's not part of the community. I know it might sound tedious to type TTG, but you know I want to see who we have here that um, was tuning in for the interview that's not yet a member of the group. So we've got Tobias, we've got Elaine. Yeah, so I guess I just type TTG for those of you that are not members of True Training Group. Fixin to Rain. What's up? What's up? What's up? Beautiful. All right. Excellent. So for those of you that are not members of True Training Group, what I'll, I'll tell you guys now, we were actually, um, the price of our membership was actually supposed to, was going to increase today from yesterday's uh, price point. But honestly, in honor of Steve Leesman coming on here and doing the interview, we have decided to keep the price exactly where it was yesterday. Do not raise the price like we were supposed to. Because uh, in honor of this this interview, this was something that we kind of were able to, to scrounge up together, wanted to do it for you guys. We got El Vieira, how are you as well? Also not a member of the group. But so I want to do you guys that solid. I want to do you guys that favor. We're going to keep that price exactly where it is. So for the people that are on here that are not members of True Training Group, I'm going to tell you real quick how you can join and why you should be interested in joining. And the, the answer and why you should be interested in joining is very, very simple. It's because our members are having success and they're making money. And I don't want you to just take my word for it. Members that are on the stream, those of you that are part of True Trading Group, just do me a favor now, type the number one if you're making money and becoming better traders with TTG. Just do me a favor and type the number one. And for the people that are not members that are on the stream, just pay attention real quick for the people that are typing the number one. These are not bots. These are your friends, your family members, your coworkers. These are real people. And if they can do it, then so can you. So this is why you should be paying attention to, or you should be interested in at least understanding how do you join True Training Group? What's the cost? What are the things that you get included with it? So that you guys can start becoming part of the community, get the real-time trade alerts, the moderators and I, that collectively as a group, the moderators and I have been able to maintain a cumulative win rate on all of our executions of just around 80% now going on roughly the last four years. Our members get access to a professional level of education. They get access to, you know, obviously some amazing commentary from the moderators, but also people and special guests like Steve Leesman. And then obviously they get access to the real-time trade alerts and the mobile app and everything else. So for those of you that are not members, do yourself a favor, go to ttgoffer.com. That's ttgoffer.com. Enter the coupon code TTG121. Now, when you hit ttgoffer.com, you'll notice the price says $1,212. However, since you're on this live stream with me, okay, I'm giving you this coupon code, TTG121. Manually type it in, click apply code. The price then drops down to just 609 bucks for the whole year. Now, that 609 bucks, what does it get you? Our chat room our mobile app. The mobile app lets you be connected even if you're not in front of your computer. 82% of our members have full-time jobs. They're able to follow along with what goes on in TTG because of the mobile app. You get real-time push notifications when our moderators enter and exit positions. You will also be getting access to all the real-time trade alerts, obviously. You'll get um, the video library with over a thousand hours of workshops covering different topics by the mods. You'll get the watch list every day from the mods and I, where we tell you exactly what stocks we're focused on with entry and exit prices. So you know where to focus your time, your energy, and your attention before the day even begins. So all of that's included in the 609. You also get all of our courses, a 22 course curriculum, which is a simplified and expanded upon version of the training that I received when I worked at a fund in New York. There's beginner courses, advanced courses, options, swing trading, trader psychology, crypto, you name it, we've got it. They're all included for the 609. There's no VIP pro courses that are going to cost you another thousand bucks after you join. They're all included in the 609. And for the people that are here that might be skeptical, I'll erase that skepticism by offering you a double your money back guarantee. See, Adam and I, who you just saw on the stream, that's my business partner and co-founder of True Trading Group. We believe so strongly in the platform that we have created and its ability to help you become successful that we offer double your money back if you're unable to make back your membership fee. So this is how it works. You join True Trading, you pay 609. If you go through our courses, pass our quizzes and attend one study group, we do study groups every week, they're free, attend one. And you have the whole year to do these things. You don't have to go through the courses within like 14 days. You have the whole year. Take your time, go at your own pace. If you do those things and then you're unable to make enough winning trades to equal 
The 609 membership fee, you can make it back at least once during your membership. We will then give you back $1,218. That's double what you're going to pay to join. The double your money back guarantee. It's real. It's right there on the checkout page. It's in black and white. Go read it. We have to welcome Elizabeth. Welcome back to True Trading Group, Elizabeth. Elizabeth was a member in the past, left, got busy with life and work. COVID ended, now came back to True Trading Group. Elizabeth, welcome back home to the TTG family. Everybody, welcome back, Elizabeth. If you also listen to me carefully, if you're on this stream and you used to be a member, you used to be a trial member, you have to send us a text message, okay? The, the number to text is 1-888-306-8783. Right down there at the bottom of your screen, text that number, one 888 306 eight, seven, eight, three, text that number. We have to whitelist your email address in order for you guys to get the 609 price point. So if you have any questions, if you used to be a member, used to be a trial member, you text that number, we'll help you up. We'll give you that 609 price point. And don't forget, you have the double your money back guarantee, which I really don't think you need considering our refund rate is actually less than two and a half percent. Our retention rate at True Training Group is 78%. That means 78% of our members have either renewed their annual membership or they become a lifetime member of the community. My TTG fam with me on this stream, do me a favor, type the number two if you have been a member for longer than one year or if you are a lifetime member of the group, type the number two. The people that are on here that are maybe skeptical of joining, ask yourself this question. Why would all of the people that you see typing the number two why on earth would they renew their membership? Why on earth would they become lifetime members of the platform if they were not having success, did not find value in what it was that we offer at True Training Group? Ask yourself this, hypothetical, played out. Let's say you did join. Let's say you put 609 bucks on a credit card or maybe use PayPal credit, paid off over six months. Hell, we even offer Klarna. If you guys want to use Klarna, you can text that number 1-888-306-8783. We do accept Klarna as a payment option. But let's say you join today and you pay 609. Let's fast forward to March 27th of 2025. It's time for your membership to renew. And again, it'll renew at the 609. You're not going to have to, you don't have to pay the 1212 after renewal. If you, if you join 609, you are locking yourself into the 609 price. So you'd only pay 609 next year as well. But let's play it forward. It's 2025. You didn't make any money. Matter of fact, you lost money. You learned nothing. Would you renew your membership? No, of course you wouldn't. Would you become a lifetime member of the community? Of course not. Lifetime membership is thousands of dollars. Of course you would not do that. Then why the hell did all of those people that you just saw type the number two? It's because they're making money. It's because they're learning. They're becoming better traders. They're finding success. That's why. That's why they do it. And that, again, is why you should be interested in learning how to join your trading group. Go to ttgoffer.com. Enter the coupon code TTG121. Click apply code. The price drops down to 609. Check out and you are good to go. If you guys have any questions, text us. We're fully transparent. We are an open book. 1-888-306-8783. Does anybody have any questions for me based on the interview that we just had with Steve? So if you're just joining us, we just wrapped up uh, an inter interview with Steve Leisman from CNBC. If you guys missed it, you can go rewind, go back, um, check it out. Some really great information there. But does anybody have any questions for me regarding Steve and some of the things that Steve said? Anybody have questions for me that you guys want to talk about before we go? Don't forget, members, the AI Accelerator with Adam is taking place in the main chat room immediately following the live or 6 o'clock. It might be 6 I think it's 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock with Adam inside the main chat room. Oh, yeah, Dwayne, I saw that, Dwayne. AVTX, man, going nuts after hours. I saw that, brother. You know, I was so tempted to take a look and try to maybe even trade this thing. Um, but obviously, I couldn't. I was interviewing Steve Leisman. But I don't trade after hours very often at all. It's I can probably count on one hand how many times I do it. Um, but, I mean, this AVTX was damn, damn pretty. Um, and definitely, I mean, look at this. 
Guys, the stock was was four dollars and seventy cents. It's now at twenty two. Crazy move. Crazy move. So AVTX coming to life. So Mike, you think we're going to have a strong market during the back end of this year from what Steve thinks? Armand, I do. I, I do think the market finishes the year strong, but I think we have a hiccup. I think we have a hiccup in the next few months. So the way that I think the market plays itself out is you get a bit of a pullback in the middle of the year, um, maybe towards the end, middle to end of the summer. And it could come when, like Steve said, right? Steve said, I don't think June is a lock. Meaning like, I don't think that a rate cut in June is, is guaranteed. Well, what if the Fed does not cut rates in June? If the Fed doesn't cut rates in June, then maybe that's the catalyst. Maybe that's a catalyst for a, a market decline and for a market pullback. Or maybe the maybe the consumer and the jobs market begins to weaken, you know, as you get deeper into the year. And then the market has this little bit of a of a hiccup. Um, but then once the Fed actually starts cutting and the labor market is is, you know, the labor market, you know, proves to be stable. Then I think the market rallies into the election. It's actually 2025 is what I'm concerned about. For me, 2025 is actually, so when people are talking about like, oh, recession, I think there is far more likely a chance of a recession in 2025 than there is in 2024. Um, what I have started to think about is, and I didn't get to ask Steve this question because he, he had to go, but one of the questions that I wanted to ask Steve I had a lot of questions that I didn't get to ask him, um, but we'll do it again. We'll do that again with Steve. Um, but one of the questions I had for him was, do the previous indicators of a recession that we've known for the last hundred years, do those no longer matter? Because in the past, every time with a 100% accuracy, when you have had an oil price shock, meaning oil spikes to like over hundred dollars a barrel very quickly. When you've had an oil price shock, an inverted yield curve and a fed rate hike cycle, when those three things have happened together, which they did in 2022, a recession has followed within the next nine to 16 or nine to 18 months. There's been a recession. Every time in history, there has not been a time when those things happened and a recession did not follow. So if we had a soft landing and there was no recession, this would be the first time in history that those recession signals didn't lead to a recession. Lisa Ann, I see you're having trouble. Lisa Ann, you're having trouble signing up. Lisa, send a text message, Lisa, to one 888 306-8783. Lisa Ann, the phone number is right down there at the bottom of your screen. 1-888-306-8783. Send us a text message. We will help you sign up. We see you're having an issue on the checkout page. So that was a question that I wanted to ask him. And the answer that I have is that they don't not matter anymore. I just think everybody underestimated the timing of it. We've never once before in history, we've never once before in history, um, oh, and Lisa did join. Lisa's in, Lisa's in, beautiful. Lisa, welcome to the TTG family, guys. Everybody welcome Lisa. Oh, there's Lisa, there she is right there. Lisa, welcome to the TTG fam. Everybody welcome Lisa. Lisa, yep, we got you, Lisa. It is, you, yep, we got the confirmation you are in. Lisa, welcome to the True Training Group family. It's our pleasure to have you on board. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, so going back to, to what I was saying, um, I think 
You've never had before a moment in time where trillions of dollars were injected into the global economy. So nobody really knew how that was going to play out. And I, what I think is, what I think makes more and more sense or is more and more probable or possible, I should say, not probable, but possible is that all of that liquidity simply extended the amount of time before it happens. And everybody was so, oh, we're going to have a recession. We're going to have a recession. We're going to have a recession, including myself. I thought we were going to have a recession too. And it didn't happen. And here we are in 2024 and the economy looks good and inflation's coming down and GDP is, is nowhere near zero. Unemployment's at 3.9, which is still very, very, very low. Is it possible that everybody kind of lets their guard down in 2024 thinking it's we we kind of skirted you know the recession and then it pops up in 2025 i think that that is a more likely scenario than a recession happening in 2024 at this point um so that's something that I've really been starting to think about from a, a more of a macro view. Um, so I'm actually more concerned kind of post-election rather than pre-election. Um, and it's also an election year. The stock market typically does well in election years. You know, we've had two bear markets in the last three years, which is actually extremely rare. We had the bear market in 2020. Then you had a bear market in 2024, uh, 2022. Very rare that that happens. And I know you had, uh, I know 1980 and 1982, that was the double dip recession with bear markets in each year. But it's very, very uncommon for you to get bear markets that close together. But it's also very uncommon you get a global pandemic that shuts down the world, right? So I just feel like I'm more worried about 2025 than I am 2024. I think that any type of a pullback or like a, a little bit of a panic in 2024 is viable for an end of year recovery. And then I think you, you, you got to be cautious going to 2025. So yeah, that's possible too, Muggsy, for sure. For sure. Muggsy's like, is it possible too that all that liquidity just stops the recession from happening altogether? Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely possible too. That's, that's the thing about, you hear people say, um, oh, but it's different. It's, this time it's different. This time it's different. This time it's different. Throughout history, every other time that people are like, oh, but it's different this time. It really never was different. It was, it was all exactly just the same. Just the catalyst was different. But the inner workings were exactly the same. Now, really for the first time, at least in my professional career, I could say with a straight face that it actually is different this time. Because what transpired were things that have never happened before in history, where the entire economy gets shut off with the flip of a switch, and then you inject trillions of dollars into the global economy. And then all of a sudden, after you inject the trillions of dollars of liquidity, you then flip the, the global economy back on with the flip of a switch. That's never happened before, ever. So nobody really knew how that was going to play out. So you can really, for the first time, say... Well, this time it actually is different. So maybe the outcome is different. Maybe there is no recession for the first time ever after getting those three recession indicators. Sure. Absolutely possible. You know, absolutely possible. I'm not, I'm not, you know, so naive or so arrogant rather to say that like a different scenario is not possible. Any scenario is possible at this point and and I keep my mind open to a soft landing. I keep my mind open to a recession. The, the least likely scenario that I think is the no landing where the economy just doesn't even slow down and just continues to just grow, 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 grow. I think that's, I mean, I would be the most surprised if that was how this played out. Um, just because I don't think inflation is going to get to 2% if the economy start, just continues to just beast. 
Um, I think you really need the economy to slow down and then have the soft landing in order for inflation to get to 2%. But listen, you can't deny, you can't deny what the market has done. Right. And, and this is why I preach to people's into people into your trading group that you just have to continue to, you got to continue to think for the long haul and you got to continue to think further into the future because there's a lot of, there's going to be a lot of instances in the future, just like there were the last couple of years. There's going to be a lot of instances where there's going to be something wrong. There's going to be something lurking in the background that is going to cause a stock market crash. And sometimes a stock market crash, stock market crash actually will occur. Other times it won't. Regardless, whenever markets go down, you got to buy stuff. You have to. I don't care what your what, what your reasonings are, right? I don't care if you're like, oh, but Mike, but Mike, uh, bricks. Oh, but Mike, the U.S. dollar is going to lose its global reserve currency status. Oh, but Mike, there's going to be World War III. Oh, but Mike. Uh, the election. Oh, but Mike, uh, commercial real estate. Oh, but Mike, um, you know, whatever, <laughs> like whatever the, there's always a list. There's always a list of things and reasons why the market might crash. But I'd say out of 10 times it happens two or three and you just can't, you can't, go about your entire investing life being scared of all of these what if catalysts because most of them never occur and even when they do occur the result is nowhere near as bad as you initially thought they were going to be the problem is everybody is trained now to think that every recession is 2008 and it's not 2008 is literally called the great recession for a reason it's the worst recession that we've ever had. <laughs> okay. Now, yes, you have the depression in the twenties, right? But it's the worst recession that we've ever had. That's why it's called the great recession. Every recession doesn't need to be 2008. Recessions are actually normal cycles. The normal economic cycle, right? A normal economic cycle includes recession. It doesn't have to always be the end of the world. And for, for you to go about your investing career saying, no, I'm not buying anything. You're crazy. There's going to be a depression. The dollar is going to lose its global reserve currency status. The market's going to go down 80%. Uh, the banks are going to collapse. We're all going to be living in the woods and we're all going to pay with Bitcoin. Like if that's what you really honestly think is going to happen, then I honestly, I can't help you and I can't save you. And you'll never invest in the markets and you'll wait for that, the markets to crash. And eventually at some point, the market's going to go down 50% again. Eventually at some point, that's going to happen. But are they going to go down 50% from 522? Are they going to go down 50% from 600? Are they going to go down 50% from 750? I don't know. But I'm sure at some point in my life, I'll see another 40 to 50% decline and I'll see a severe recession. And you want to know what I'm going to do during that moment? I'm going to buy the shit out of everything. That's what I'm going to do. But if you spend your entire life trying to predict when that exact moment's going to come, you want to know what you end up missing? You end up missing all of that. You end up missing all of that. Because right here, everybody said there's going to be a depression. There's going to be a Lehman Brothers moment. So if, if you're like, nah, screw it. Well, look where the market is now. Look what you've missed out on. My long-term portfolio, you know, I don't look at it often, but I looked at it recently. It's not even funny. It's really not even funny. When your long-term portfolio is stacked with companies like NVIDIA, Companies like Broadcom, companies like AMD, companies like CrowdStrike, companies like Microsoft, companies like Meta, right? Like 
when this is what your long-term portfolio is stacked with, it's just absolutely ridiculous the kind of money and the kind of wealth that you miss out on by always thinking negatively. 84% of the time, the market goes up. I don't, that's not the exact number. I'm just, I pulled that number. It's, you know, it's close to that. I don't know the exact number, but like 80% of the time, the market goes up. So why, why always continuously try to think about the negative and try to think about, oh, I'm, I'm going to get it right the time that it goes down. And maybe you do get it right the time that it goes down, but you want to know what I'd much rather do? I would much rather educate myself to a point where I know how to make money when the markets go down so that you can short stocks, you can buy put options, you can make money when the markets go down from a trading perspective, take that profit and then buy it, buy everything that just went down, buy it in your long-term portfolio. That is what you should do. You would be so much better off. You'd be so much better off if you invested for the long term. Every year, money goes into the market for me. I don't care if the markets are up, down, left, right, sideways, inside out. I go every single time, every year, I max out my SEP IRA, the max contribution that I'm allowed, and I put even more money in just in my, in my other, the other portfolios that I have. Every year, no matter what's going on, doesn't matter. The years that the market is red, a lot more money goes into the market. I do bigger chunks when the markets are red because the markets aren't red that often. And you got to take advantage of that stuff. I'm also 38 years old. I'm not 70. If I was 70, I would, I would act differently. You heard, you know, Steve Leisman talking about that. Now he's 60. My father's 67. So you start, you know, you, you, you reduce some of that, that risk and you lock in some more fixed income stuff just to stabilize. Cause when you're, you know, once you get up into that age at that, that age bracket, you're not so much worried about capital growth as much as you are capital preservation. And there's a difference with that stuff. And I highly recommend, I'm not a licensed financial advisor. Don't take retirement advice from me. I tell you what I'm doing with my own money and, and my thoughts on the market. You take that information, do whatever you want. But I highly recommend that everybody speaks to a retirement professional so you can go over your own financial needs um, and your own financial goals and your own financial situation. But continue to invest for the long term and for the long haul. And just educate yourself and learn a skill that allows you to make money when the markets do go down. So that when 2022 happens, you're not just sitting there like this, watching your 401k balance go down. You can buy puts, you can short stocks, make money on the way down, and then take all that profit and then add it into, the, into your 401k, your IRA at those lower prices, and then sit back, put your, kick your feet up. And two, three years later, you're like, oh, wow, that was amazing. Happy I did it. That's the way this game works, man. But everybody gets caught up in in the, the hyperboles and the exaggerations and the, the fear mongering and the doomsdays, the doomsdayers. You know how many doomsdayers there have been? You know how many times the world was supposed to end over the last 80 years? Literally. You, you know how many times? You go back from the Great Depression until today. You know how many times people said that, oh, no, this is it. This is it. And here we are, all-time highs, May 27, March 27, 2024. So hopefully you guys take advantage of the, the code I'm offering. Join the group, educate yourselves, put yourself in a better position. There's a reason why you saw so many people of your trading group tell you that they're making money. You can too. Go to ttgoffer.com, use the code TTG121, click apply code, the price drops to 609. You guys have any questions at all, text us 1-888-306-8783. Thanks for tuning in tonight, folks. Guys, the AI Accelerator is starting inside the main chat room. All of my TTG members that are part of the AI Accelerator with Adam, head into main chat for your session. The rest of you, uh, subscribe to the channel, smash the like button, turn on your notifications. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoyed the interview with Steve. A big thank you to Steve again. And if you guys have not yet done so, click on the link, donate to Riverkeeper, show some love. It's a great cause. And let Steve know how much that we appreciate him spending time with us here today. Thanks for tuning in here, folks. I will see you all tomorrow. Have a great